1 Timothy 4, verse 13. I'm just going to skip through this stuff. To reach full potential, you've got to devote yourself. Verse 14. To reach full potential, you don't neglect the gift which is in you. Don't just put it to the side and put it down. You've got to work with it. Verse 15. To reach full potential, you've got to practice and cultivate. Practice and cultivate. Not just practice, practice, practice and cultivate. You've got to throw yourself wholly into what the Lord has for you in your life. So that your progress may be evident for everybody to see. Because He wants everybody to see. And verse 16. You've got to persevere. You will not reach full potential unless you persevere. Because you'll save both yourself and those who hear you. Amen. Father, thank you for your word. I'm excited about what you got today. Holy Spirit, help me get it out the way you put it in. In Jesus' name, we give you glory, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. As I find my place here. Hallelujah. The Word knows, the Word knows, the Word knows what's to be cut and what's to stay put. Because not everything in you is bad news. Not everything in you needs to be revamped or renewed. Sometimes you think that, sometimes you're, in your life you think you just need a total remodel when you just need a few adjustments and you'll be fine. And the Word knows what's to stay and what's to go. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Throw that on the screen. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture. How much Scripture? All. All Scripture. Let me say that. Just because it's an old book does not mean it's Scripture. That's one thing that separates us from a lot of uh, other Religious, what I'll call, just go ahead and call them cults. They've got other books that they adhere, adhere to outside of the Word of God that they consider Holy Scripture. Well, we don't do that out here. If it ain't in the book, it ain't. Now, I'll preach it from Holy Bible to bonded leather, and I don't know everything, but there's only one book. And that's what we take a look at. We try to take a look in the book, not a bunch of other books. Amen? So all scripture is given by inspiration of God himself. A lot of translations even, uh, there put God breathe. If you've got an NIV, an Amplified, or an uh, English Standard Version, that's what it says, that it's God breathed. All scripture is God breathed and is profitable. In other words, it yields a return. The word of God yields a return. Y'all know what yielding a return means. You don't invest unless you expect to yield a return. It's beneficial and it's useful. Well, what does, what's it useful for? What does it yield a return on? First of all, for doctoring. That means teaching and education. You can't do better until you know better. It's like, why are they all jacked up? They don't know better. Nobody's ever taught them. They don't know a better way. The only way they know is the, uh, the last example. In other words, their last point of reference. If their last point of reference was Uncle Frank, and Uncle Frank's life is a mess, and he always makes bad decisions, but the only time they ever had any kind of an example of a situation they're going through was Uncle Frank, well, guess what they're going to lean towards? What Uncle Frank did. You could be, man, that was so stupid. Why'd you do that? Oh. Truth is, is, that's the only example they ever had. But the Word of God, listen, can teach you and it can educate you. It's profitable for doctrine. It's also profitable and it yields a return for reproof. What does that mean? That just means conviction. It's profitable for a conviction. It'll show you what's right and what's wrong. I love this, uh, when I went into the Greek about it, a word here that's interesting for this particular word, reproof, it means evidence. In other words, when you have a conviction on something, listen, it's evidence within you. I love that when I saw that. It's not just, well, I got a, 
you know, I got a funny feeling going on on the inside of me or something like that. No, you have evidence now. The Word of God is not only profitable for education, but it's also profitable for evidence. That conviction on the inside of you. Listen, in other words, listen, let me break it down. You see it. Amen. You might not tell everybody because you ain't ready to, you know, be called a Jesus freak. <laughs> Why not? Amen. Amen. But you see it. You see something. It's yeah. evidence. It's also profitable for correction. That's an okay word in this generation, y'all. It's okay. It's profitable for correction. That means, listen, improvement. Who doesn't want to improve? If you ain't at perfection, then you need correction. You need correction with affection, but you need correction. I don't know. Maybe I'm geared different than, than some of the others, but I don't want to do something wrong over and over and over and over again. Well, if you keep doing it wrong, either f for one thing, um, you're insane because the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expect different results. Either you're insane or you're just, you're just that sad. You want to fail. You like to fail. I don't get you. I don't understand you. And you don't even understand yourself because we were not designed that way. We were designed to be full, fruitful and multiply. Amen. So for correction, that means for improvement, for restoration. It's with the implication of a previous condition of faults or failures. In other words, we can, it's good for us so we can get it right. It's also profitable for instruction. That's a little different. Teaching is just one thing. Teaching is blah, 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 blah. You either listen or you don't. But here, for instruction, that means discipline. It means training with the intent of forming proper habits or behaviors. The Bible didn't say to teach your children. It said to train your children. Don't think I'm comparing your children to animals when I say this. I'm just giving you an analogy. When you bring a little puppy in, you want a little puppy and you want to keep the puppy in the house, it's one of them little lap dogs and you bring that dog into the house, that dog is just not on its own automatically going to go to the corner where you got the puppy pad and use the bathroom on that puppy pad. You can't just say, now, 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 I've told you, you cute little snapper, you. You've got to go over there when you pee-pee. Now look at Daddy. He's having to come over here and clean, clean, clean. That's a no, no, no. That's not going to get the job done, isn't it? No, it's not. You know what you got to do? You got to train that dog. In other words, hands-on. You've got to be there when it happens. You've got to keep your eye on them. You've got to set them over there. It takes a while, doesn't it? That's training. You've got to train. The Word of God, listen, is profitable for training. Amen? Training. In righteousness, that means doing what is right. It's profitable for, it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction. Listen, in doing things right. If you ain't doing it by the word, you ain't doing it right. It'll catch up with you. It will. God is not going to be mocked. Amen. That the man of God, why all this? That the man of God may be, listen, complete, perfect. That means complete, qualified, and sufficient. So much lack going on in the world today. You hear that lack, 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 lack. You know, ships out in the ocean, we can't get this product, can't get that product. We like this, we like that. You might even went to the grocery store, your favorite brand ain't, you know, they don't even have or carry it no more. Lack, lack, lack. Well, this is telling us that when we do these things in righteousness, that there will be no lack. That we may be sufficient, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That works there means performance, the result or object of this employment. I love that definition. In other words, you're good at your job. For all good works, your, your employment with the Lord, making or working the task, the, your performance. You're thoroughly furnished for all of these. 
So instead of having a crisis in your life and you have a breakdown and you're bawling and squalling and begging God, you could have already been in the Word of God and have gotten teaching, gotten reproof, gotten instruction, gotten training. Listen, so you'll be thoroughly furnished and sufficient and to all good works. You don't have a breakdown because you've already got a plan down. You and Holy Spirit got together. Amen? Hallelujah. So that's what the Word of God will do. It thoroughly furnishes you unto all these good works. And it's good for and profitable for doctrine, correction, for instruction. Throw Hebrews 4.12 on the screen. This is from the Amplified Version. For the, word of, for the word that God speaks is alive and full of power, making it active, operative, energized, and effective. That's what that means. It's full of power. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Penetrating to the dividing line of the breath of life, the soul, and the immoral, immortal spirit. Cuts right through. Is that me? Is that God? Is that the devil? It'll cut right through. And let you know which one is which. And of joints and marrow. In other words, of the deepest part of our nature. Why am I the way I am? What's making me tick? Why is this? Why is that? Da, 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 da. And exposing and sifting and analyzing and judging the very thoughts and purposes of your heart. That's what the Word of God will do. That's why it's the qualified one. It knows what's to be cut and what's to stay put in your life. And nothing will change in your life until you do. I don't care if you come up here and I put a whole bucket of oil on your head, get all the leadership around, and we just pray in tongues over you for 30 minutes straight. Nothing will change in your life until you do. I can't, and listen, and I can't lay hands on wrong thinking. I have all the authority that he says I have, but he never said we had authority to change somebody's mind. That's right. You, baby, got to do that all on your own. Yes, you do. Can't lay hands on wrong thinking. Nothing going to change in your life until you do. Full potential is intentional, not accidental. Well, if I just keep coming out to church, if I just keep hearing pastor preach, if I read a few verses and a few scriptures today, then it's just going to be okay. That is not the process. That is part of the process. But if you don't want to change, you won't, and nothing will change in your life until you do. Are you willing to change you? Are you willing to start conforming into his image and instead of the image that you want to see? Jesus. Or you're under bondage because you're being conformed to the image that they say you are. Yeah. Amen. Oh me. Oh my. Something. Amen. You're never going to just stumble into full potential. Yeah. It's not accidental. It's intentional. Amen. And people who don't want to change won't I'll help those who want help I'll heal those who want healing but I will depart from those who refuse to change oh I have learned that over the years I wanted to get everybody saved when I first got into the ministry and I thought if they just knew what I knew I'll just give them the same scriptures that you know hit me at the house and it's like it changed my life they just rolled their eyes. <laughs> so what did you do, and so it's like, I mean, I know what you're going through. Let me, let me, let me get you. Hey, Brother Keith Moore, Brother Keith Moore, you need to listen to this teaching by Brother Keith Moore. I know you're, you're, you're going through bodily aches and pains. Look, God's will to heal that message. There's 17 messages. That'll transform your life. Look, you'll be stronger than horseradish on healing if you go through that. 
And you get back with them three weeks later, and they're complaining about how worse they're doing and everything. Oh, man, I'm so sorry. Have you had a chance to, 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 to check out that message series? No. You ain't even looked at one of them? No, I've not had time. Well, you got time to go to the doctor, obviously. What do you mean you ain't got time? Mm. If you want it, you want it. But if you don't, you don't. And you won't get it because it's not accidental. It's intentional for full potential. When you want something bad enough, you'll find a way. Then people that stole the gas out of the van, they wanted gas bad enough. It's the same principle. It's used in a ne negative format. Same way with people that's on crack. You see them out on the side of the street, they addicted to something. Listen, they need to be set free and delivered. And by the way, they're precious people that Christ died for too. They're just under bondage. Hello? They need to get set free. If they want to be set free, that's a whole other message too. Some don't want to be set free. But, but, but you see them out there and it's like they don't have two pennies to roll together. And then you see them later on that night and they're high as a kite again. You're like, oh, wait a minute now, wait a minute. You didn't even have two pennies to rub together and you got another hit? You got some more rock? How'd you get that rock? <laughs> I found a way. <laughs> and somebody in the neighborhood missing something in the backyard that the pawn shop got. Come on now. Either that or they just did a bargain and the, you know, their, their, their supplier said, man, it'd be nice to have a such and such. And they're like, well, I can hook you up on that. And then the, the, the dealer's like, well, then I can hook you up on that. Now, that's in the negative light. But where there's a will, there's a way. Amen? Amen. So if you want something bad enough, you'll find a way. If you don't, you'll find an excuse. Listen, sometimes there's legitimate stuff. I'm not here to get on a soapbox and be Mr. Angry, Point Finger, Growly Guy, okay? That's just not me, but I will be straight up sometimes. But there's a lot of empty seats right here that are full of nothing but excuses. They look empty, but they're full of excuses. They're just full of excuses. And, and as, I, as, as, as I was saying right after worship, the Lord's coming through. And the word that you need, the anointing that you need, the release that you need, the freedom that you need, the deliverance that you need was in the house and you wasn't. And you wonder sometimes, I'm just going to be real with you, and you wonder sometimes, God, I've been praying about this for three weeks and it just you seem so silent on it. It's like, well, yeah, I'd told you two weeks ago I didn't hear you of course not you wasn't in my house but I said it loud and clear where were you at Adam where art thou where were you at I was there I met your need how come you wasn't there you know you're in bad shape when you start giving your excuses. You can give them to me or your family members, but when you start talking to God like you talk to your pastor, like, like it's going to fly, like God's going to understand. Amen? That's why you need to find your place, stay in your place. Amen? Because God will speak to you there. There's not, I'll just try to be real quick. Since 2013, there, I think there's less than I can count them, count them in one hand less than five times I've ever missed a, a Sunday morning message from my pastor. And all these years, I am not going to go through the week until I hear from my pastor. And you don't know how many times I have heard what I needed from my pastor. And I could only, I mean, I was sitting about that, that one day I was thinking, Man, what if I was so wrapped up in what God's got here and the people that he's got under me and their needs and praying, da da da, da. What if I just, just didn't listen to my voice anymore? Because God has sent him. Did, did that say that, that the Lord has sent gifts unto men? Well, he's my gift that I'm appreciative of. And I can only imagine how many mistakes I would have made over the years if I hadn't have been listening to his voice. 
and have been a part of the fellowship that I'm under to have other men and women of God that are seasoned to speak into my life. Oh, my goodness. I don't even know. I mean, seriously, I don't even know if we'd be here or not. I'd made so many bad decisions and calls. I am not going to miss a message. Amen? This is why people who don't want to change also don't want to read the Word of God or go to a church where the Spirit of God is moving strong. Because His Word is the change agent. That's why they come in and they get itchy feeling and start moving around. And keep looking at the watch. Can't wait to get out of here. Why? Because the change agent is trying to make changes to the one who don't want to change. And they don't like being in it. They don't like the reproof, the instruction, the training, the correction. Listen, and it's all to conform you into the image of his son. It's all to try to get heaven to earth. It's all to operate into a system that he's provided for you to take care of all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. It's for your good. Oh. Amen. Holy Spirit breathed unchanging, unwavering principles from the word of God will cause someone who's content on who they are or what lifestyle they live or where they're at in life to be under conviction or agitation. In other words, I ain't going to change. Well, they're aggravated the whole time they ain't here. Attitude and everything rising up like a volcano. <laughs> yeah, we see you. We see you. Or they want to change. And the conviction comes in. And they be crying more than Steve. Amen. Amen Steve. But whether it's conviction or aggravation, you cannot be in the presence of Almighty God with something not going on. Yeah. Either you will be softened or you're going to be hardened. Yeah. But it's not just going to be nothing. Oh, you might walk out thinking, I'm hard. I'm hard. I'm tough, man. It not bother me. Yeah, it is 1 a.m. when you woke up from that dream, bad dream that you had and the Lord trying to talk to you about something and you woke up and you're sweating and you're crying and you're hoping nobody hears you. Because you know, and God knows too, and he's trying to talk to you about something. People don't hang around here very long uh, like that being conformed to this world because his spirit will draw them to the Lord as does reading the word of God for themselves. I've noticed that those who really don't want to change, they don't stay around here very long. Why? Because the change agent is here. Amen. Every time they come in, it's like button heads. They're confronting the Spirit of God that's talking to them. Uh, they might go to some other places and walk in, walk out, no conviction, no nothing, sit on the back row. Nobody knows they're there. Just for conscience sake, they're in and out. No problem. Not in here. God's going to get a hold of somebody when they come in this building. Amen. And we give him the praise and the glory for that. Amen. Jesus, the word, is the potter and we are the clay. So don't let anyone other than Jesus ever again mold you into their perspective of you. We've all done it from time to time. I was speaking with some people out in the foyer earlier, my old lifestyle, being in a rock band, playing an electric guitar, lead guitar, long hair everywhere, wearing the boots and the... All kinds of different stuff. and Why in the world did you do that? Because they did that. Who are they? Oh, all the people that, you know, put out the, the CDs that I listened to growing up. Yeah. I was conforming into their image. Yeah, it was a big deal for me when I got my hair cut off. Why? Because I had wrapped my whole identity into rock and roll music. Yeah. And if I cut my hair, I'm no longer rock and roll, man. So where do I fit in? Who do I hang with? Come on. That's why young people today won't give stuff up. Why? I'm just telling you, because I can remember. Because they're of an identity, because everybody else is wearing it. Everybody else is watching it. Everybody else is TikToking it. Everybody else is. And then all of a sudden, that's, listen, it's scary, parents, because their, their identity is starting to be based in something that's not a God. Yeah, yeah. So it was a big deal when it went whoosh. 
because I started putting my identity in him. Yeah. Amen. And I don't have anything against long hair. It's just that, you know, the Lord told me to do it before I would go around preaching. You might have preachers with long hair. Look, not against it. So the Spirit of God says, whatever is not done in faith is sin. Well, he kind of told me some things about it for me. Okay, if he didn't tell somebody else, then that's okay because there's a whole section of people that won't listen to me, but they can walk in with their, with their long hair and stuff like that, and, and they'll listen to them. Amen. So don't think this is like a right or wrong thing with the long hair. This is what the Lord told me. My identity was wrapped up in it. Yeah. Somebody else could have hair down to their ankles, but their identity is wrapped up in Christ. That's between them and God. That ain't my business. Amen. Yeah. All right now. But don't let anyone other than Jesus mold you into the perception of you and not God's perception of you, the real true you. Put 2 Corinthians 5.17 up there. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a what? A new creation, a new creature. You're a new creature. Ephesians 4.24. I'm going to pop through some. And that ye put on the what? The new man. So we got a new creation. We got a new man. What about Romans 12 2? Romans 12 2. <clears throat> and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. A new creation. The new man. Transformation. And as we are transformed on the inside, the proof is evident on the outside, as others can see. What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? Listen, through our lives. Throw Romans 12, 2 back on the screen. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. They start seeing it in your life. What is in the inside is always going to come out. What's in is what's coming out. Because we are all are like sponges. We soak stuff in every day of our lives. And when the squeeze is on a sponge, what happens? What's on the inside comes right out. And the first time there's a squeeze on, listen, you think you're doing all right? Wait till the next time a squeeze is on and you know what's really on the inside of you. When we had a hot water heater to go out on us a few weeks ago and we finally got somebody over and it was supposed to be a quick 20-minute fix and it turned out to be he has got to come back the next day and he couldn't get it done for a, quite a few hours. <laughs> there was some stuff coming out. <laughs> and I was like, okay, this is a good indication of where I'm actually at in life right now. But that was good introspection. Listen, it gave me a chance to see some things. Everything's okay now. Praise God. But it took long enough. It's like finally the parts he wanted, finally he finally got. And I was like, why didn't you do that to begin with? Why didn't you just come over and say, I, I can't get what I need right now. I'm going to put it on hold. I don't know. Okay, just move on, move on. Or y'all going to get to see some of my squeeze. I don't want you to see none of my squeeze this morning. Amen. <laughs> As we're transformed on the inside, the proof is evident on the outside. You may intellectually know what the good and, and acceptable and perfect will of God is. That's called mental assent. You might know that it's God's will for you to be healed, and you can amen at the right places because you've heard it preached and you've read it. You can intellectually know that, mental assent. But the first time something starts happen in your body really bad do you freak out panic and want to call 911 or the first thing that you do is you start quoting that scripture you did on church on Sunday because you're going to find out what you really believe and who your source really is real quick so you might intellectually know what the good acceptable and perfect will of God is but but you can't prove it in your life apart from the transforming work of the Holy Spirit. It's just not going to happen. You can't smart yourself into it. It's going to take the Holy Spirit. 
And that's what's odd today. I was sharing on Wednesday night. You hear all kinds of messages from all kinds of pastors all over the place these days about your purpose, your destiny, the, what God would have for your life, your calling. And you hear all these encouraging messages, and it sounds like more like life coaching than it does Bible preaching, amen? Where's the preachers? God wants to use the preachers, not the life coaches, amen? But, but here's what's funny. They're talking about your purpose and your destiny. But yet they never talk about Holy Spirit. The only one that does know your purpose and the only one that knows your destiny. And you don't want to talk about him? Better stay away from that stuff. Because the only one person knows your true purpose and your true destiny and his name is holy spirit he's not a it he's a him and he's god the spirit the father the son and the spirit he's god the spirit he's the only one that does you can't have a future destiny purpose uh message without talking about holy spirit hallelujah i got on my soapbox i got off of it the mind renewed enables us to discern the will of god Throw Ephesians 5.17 up there. Ephesians 5.17. The mind renewed enables us to discern what the will of God is. Because you've heard people, well, if it be God's will, like you don't know what God's will is. Ephesians 5.17. Wherefore, be ye not unwise. Some translations say, don't be foolish. Be ye not unwise, don't be foolish, but understanding. In other words, to know what the will of the Lord is. We got scripture that says you're to know what the will of the Lord is, yet you got 90% of the church that their favorite prayer is, if it be thy will. Well, if you don't know what his will is, shut up. That's tight, but that's right. His word is his will. His will is his word. That's exactly what it is. It's not your opinion. It's not your tradition. It's not your experience of what did happen or didn't happen. It will always will be, always has been, his word. You're to understand the word of God. Therefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. In other words, get in the word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But the mind renewed enables us to discern this will of God. Released from the control of the world around us, we can come to know what God has in mind for us. But this is a wonderful promise that we can prove God's will in our lives. Wow. Why is it we waiting for God to prove something to us? He's already proved everything to us. It's time for us to do the proving. If we try to find God's vocation, calling, purpose, however you want to say it, for our lives but don't present ourselves to God as living sacrifices, ain't that crazy? That's like, you know, get an application and they say you're hired and then you don't even show up to work but yet you're there on Friday and say, where's my paycheck? You can't have change until there's change. Have you presented yourself a living sacrifice? Or once again, you're just going to just float around in life and think, well, if God wants it done, it'll get done. If it's his will, it'll just happen. Are you presenting yourself a living sacrifice? And do you have intimacy with Holy Spirit? Because if not, then we're frustrating God's plan. The Bible speaks about frustrating the grace of God. It talks about grieving the Holy Spirit. If we don't want to present ourselves to live in sacrifice, if we don't want to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, and we're going to hold on to worldly perceptions of who we are and what we're to do, and we don't want to listen to nobody talk about Holy Spirit, 
then we will frustrate God's plan. But God does, listen, God doesn't just want our service. He wants us. And all the promises of God are yes and amen. All the rewards, listen, all that is it's true and it's great. But you know what the best reward is? Him. Just Him. Well, I learned about tithes and offerings and sowing and reaping and money management. And I got the money rolling me in. Uh, that's still not nothing compared to him. He's that great. And I don't know about that. You've not met him that way yet then. You don't know. He's that. He is the bomb.com. He is all that and a bag of chips. He is everything. He's that awesome. Once he gets us, he'll get our service. And we'll find our place in his grace so we can function in our unction. But everybody don't want to do all that, do they? They just want to, all right, preacher, just put your hands on me and just tell me what I'm supposed to do. Oh, now that I know what I'm supposed to do, the red carpet's rolled out. Look at that. Doors opening everywhere. That's fantasy land stuff, man. I don't care if it did come from the pulpit. That's fantasy land. Living sacrifice. Renewing your mind. That's biblical right there. That's scripture right there. Hallelujah. You got to seek before you can find. Amen. Be who God has created you to be and you'll do what God has called you to do. You're thinking too much on the doing instead of the being. You're a human being, not a human doing. Be who you are and you'll end up doing what you're supposed to do. Because you find him and you, you, who you, he wants you to be in him, you don't have to worry about what you do. What you do will find you. Yeah. That's when the doors open. That's when somebody's like, daggone, who did that? Well, that was, uh, that was Esther over here. You kidding me? No, I'm not kidding you. Man, that's awesome. She got a business card or something? No, I don't think she does. She just does that on the side. Well, man, I'll pay good money for something like that. Amen. Don't get quiet on me now. Doing does not produce being, but being will generate doing. I'll say it one more time. Doing does not produce being, but being will generate doing. You prove. Not God. You prove. I think I'm going to get to some places I've been wanting to get to for about two weeks. Proof is evidence, and God wants you to present that evidence. He says, you prove what that good and acceptable perfect will of God is. God didn't say, I'm going to prove You prove it. The evidence being the progress you've made in Him. Don't put these on the screen. I'm going to fly through them. If you miss them, go back and watch it. But the evidence being the progress you've made in Him. Romans 1.17 says, from faith to faith. Start proving stuff, but from faith to faith. Going up a level. And from glory to glory. That's 2 Corinthians 3.18. There's a process involved here. 2 Peter 3.18 says, growing in grace. So they're not just one lump sum grace. You can actually grow in grace. And also the shining of your light before men. That's Matthew 5.16. And how about being exalted? That's 1 Peter 5, 6. I might have you throw that one on the screen in a minute. 1 Peter 5, 6, being exalted. And how about showing Jesus to the world as stated in our hub scripture in 1 Timothy that we've been reading all these weeks so that your progress may be evident to everybody. Throw 1 Peter 5, 6 on the screen. I want to hit that real quick. Because I'm getting ready to go into what I wanted to that I've been excited about for a whole week. Humble yourselves. Humbling does not mean you're putting yourself down. It just means you're lifting God and others up. You humble yourself. 
Well, God will humble you. That's not scripture. Now, you might be reaping some stuff you've sown and consequences has come your way. But you're to humble yourself. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt who? Exalt you in due time. God doesn't care if you're exalted, but he cares if he's not the one doing it. He wants you to be exalted as long as he's the one that is exalting you. That testimony that we heard this morning, don't you think God wants that to like, instead of some silly, I'm sorry, but just some silly person on TikTok just going, to get a million views. Don't you think God wants the actual testimony that we heard to be listened by a million people? Because you can go anywhere, anytime, and it don't matter. It ain't going to change your life at all. But you hear what God has done in somebody's life, how they raised them from a place where, you know, even the medical community is like, yeah, it ain't going to work out. And then now they're strong in the Lord and the power of his might. That's why he wants the exaltation, because the more of you that the world can see, the more of you he wants the world to see. Because it's seeing him. You got scripture for that? Of course. Apostle Paul talked about it. He talked about being exalted. No matter where he went, he's like, hey, there's the man of God. Hallelujah. Full potential is intentional. And if God be for you, who can be against you? That's Romans 8.31. So don't let up, ease up, back up, or give up. Now, this is personal, and this is where I've been wanting to go. Here it is. Who you are in Christ will never change. Your anointing will never change. Your giftings won't change. Your callings will never change. But your assignment may change frequently. And this is where you lose somebody in the body. I'm talking about even mature believers. Your anointing giftings won't change, but your assignment may change frequently even. My assignment has changed for a few years. I don't want to get into it too much, especially in this dear age where people have problems with titles and stuff. I can remember for years I was, God called me to preach, so I was a preacher. Then I started to learn something. God had me to be a teacher. And then we went on the mission field and did all the stuff in this area, and I had an evangelistic uh, call in my life. And then in 2014, a man of God pointed into our life and just like, Paul, just like the Holy Spirit told Bar, Paul and Barnabas, set them apart for the work that I have for them. And then all of a sudden in our life, God set us apart and, and gave me the office of an apostle, the one that goes and starts. That's all it means, an apostle. Apostle just means first. It means one sent to establish. I didn't get a call from God and become apostle overnight. Neither did Paul. It took years before that happened. Why well, they call you pastor just because of words and titles and it's just, not, it's just not worth it. I mean, in some camps, that's heresy to say that. And then in other camps, it's like everybody's a prophet or apostle or something. You can put a label on any empty can. You can call yourself whatever you want to call yourself. Amen. Amen. But it took years. I didn't get this anointing to go plant and build something overnight. That took years. So even though my anointing and gifting and calling hadn't changed, my assignment has changed over the years. See, your deployment, have you got about 10 minutes? Can I keep you for 10 more minutes? Is that all right? Thank you. Your deployment is your employment, soldier. Your deployment is your employment, Soldier. This is where people get confused and they get freaked out. They don't understand. Nothing has changed but your assignment. Look, if you're listed in the Marines, you are a Marine. 
You're a Marine if you're stationed in Marine Corps Base, Camp Lejeune, Jacksonville, North Carolina. You're a Marine if you're stationed in Syria. You're a Marine if you're in France, if you're in Panama, if you're in Peru, if you're in Germany, if you're in Japan, if you're in Italy, if you're in South Korea, etc. Because you're a Marine no matter where you're at. You're a Marine when you fly helicopters, when you operate radar equipment, when you drive armored vehicles, when you perform as an infantryman. You're a Marine when you gather intelligence, when you uh, survey and map territory, when you maintain and repair radios or computers or jeeps or trucks, tanks and aircrafts, and perform hundreds of other challenging jobs because you're a Marine no matter what you do. No matter where you're at and no matter what you do, if you're a Marine, you're a Marine. You're to obey orders and change your location or assignment when issued. But you never change your commitment. You never change your loyalty. You never change your character. You never change your courage. You never change your passion. Don't change your heart. Just because Master Sergeant's saying you ain't over there today, you're going to be over there. Don't mean you're not a Marine. Just because you tinkered with a helicopter yesterday and you felt good about it and now they have you over here on the Jeep doesn't change that you're a Marine. Don't change your heart. Don't change your heart towards the Lord of hosts just because he changed your assignment. Well, the Lord's my Lord. He changed your assignment and you're kind of bucking awful hard. You want to reevaluate that statement. And if anybody's been in the Marines, you don't sit there and if, you know, the master sergeant says, Sir, yes, sir, I want you to go and clean the latrine today. Sir, yes, sir. You don't hear somebody be like, Oh, now, wait a minute now. I come in first running yesterday. And I've been doing real good with my bed. Everything in the barracks is A at one okay. Are you kidding me? Listen, that might happen in life. That don't happen in the Marines or the Navy or the Air Force or the Army. It ain't going to happen. Amen. Don't change your heart towards the Lord just because he changed your assignment. And don't change your heart towards people when a season is over. We do a good job in the church of embracing people when they come. But we tend to vilify them when they go. We do good at embracing them when they come into our life for this season. But when their season's over or your season's over, sometimes we tend to vilify them as we part ways. Then we tend to make the folk in our next season pay the price for our last season's mistakes. And they have to pay the price for the disappointments. And they have to pay the price for the betrayals even though they're innocent of all charges. And the crowd said, crucify him. Ah. Hallelujah. People will pray scripture that the Lord will order their steps. I'm giving you scriptures out. Don't put them on the screen. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Proverbs 16, 9. Psalms 37, 23, that's not an end all. There's more than that, okay? That's just the examples the Holy Spirit gave me. People will pray scripture that the Lord will order their steps. But when he does, uh uh-oh. When he does, he does it according to his word that they've been praying. 
They've been decreeing that they've been meditating on so earnestly for months, sometimes even years. Then many will hold it against him. Stand to your feet as the music plays. The difference between where you are and where you want to be is what you do. Lord, order my steps. Please, Lord, I pray. Your path of righteousness, your lamp is a word to my feet. A righteous man's steps are ordered by the Lord. Lord, order my steps. I'm a righteous man. And he does. He orders your steps. And even though you're still a blood-bought, born-again, spirit-filled, spirit-led, tongue-talking, devil-stomping, child of the Most High God, and you are who you are because of the great I Am. And that doesn't change, but your assignment may have changed. Your location may have changed, but your position will never change. Maybe your condition, but not your position. And the Lord says, I'm moving you into a new season. I'm deploying you for this, for that. And he's a good God and he wants good for us. And we know that until he starts messing with us, right? It's, it's okay for everybody else. You know, God will order your steps. Even using these scriptures. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. and Lean not to thy own understanding. And all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. That's good when we're ministering to that. But we don't like it when the Lord starts speaking that to us. we got to be submissive and obedient to reach our full potential. Don't hold it against Him. Don't be hating on God. Don't be hating on where you were. Go forward. He's a good God. He's got good things for you. He's trying to give you a promotion. But when we narrow it down to the eyes of men, sometimes we lose that. I know I got you standing. Pastor Kimberly's been telling me, honey, you keep them standing too long at the end. So she's for you. She's got your back. But I remember, listen, before the Lord set me apart to establish, to start this work to establish it, which if you guys know our story, there was no... No other churches, no denominations, no nothing. It's a plant. It was a plant from the very first plant. It was a plant. But before I stepped into that office, I had a man of God tell me, because I was like, I don't know if I want to do this or not. He says, listen, where are you going to be most effective in the kingdom? Forget about titles, positions, comfort, convenience. Where are you going to be more effective in the kingdom? And even though we did some great things where we were at, impacted a lot of people and did some things, listen, nothing to the degree that we've been able to do in these last six years. Because for years we were able to maintain and manage, but God has had us leading here. So in your life, where are you going to be most effective in the kingdom? Would you want to have a title and affect 25 people? Or just be willing to be a willing vessel and affect hundreds of people? Because I'm going to tell you, as this place grows, I'm not looking for somebody to fill a title. I'm looking for people who want to help people. That's how you get qualified. Don't be bringing in your resume and I don't want to hear all that, see all that. I want to see, what I want to hear and see is are you helping people? Do you love people and want to help people? Full potential is attentional. It's not accidental. You've got to submit to God. You've got to become a living sacrifice. You've got to think and transform to be that new man, that new woman that he has created. 
and to prove what his good, acceptable, and perfect will is because he wants the world to see. If you listen to him, he'll tell you, I want the world to see me and you full potential.